Hi, this is Jordan from ThisWeekInLinux.com, and today we're going to be doing the full review of the Google CR48 with the Chrome operating system. Now, if you remember, about a week and a half ago, I received the CR48 from Google, and I've been using it quite a bit since that time. In terms of everyday usage, being able to get on it very quickly and go to YouTube, go to Gmail, Facebook, all sorts of web cloud-based services, it's very, very convenient to be able to just open it up and within a few seconds be online and on my way, rather than waiting a minute or two for my laptop to start up or worrying about the small size of my phone. But as far as the review goes, let's go ahead and take a look at the outside of the device and then we'll work our way to the inside and then the operating system at the end. So looking at the outside of the device, if you remember from the unboxing, I mentioned it had this flat, rubberized mat outside on it. It really doesn't hold fingerprints terribly well. What you're seeing here is the reflection of the overhead fluorescent lights. You can see quite a bit in that aspect, but definitely not as much as you would probably see on a glossy outside of a netbook or something like that. I owned a 10-inch netbook before, and I have to tell you, it held a lot more fingerprints than this little thing has. And while we're looking at the outside, it is only fair to take a look at the battery. It is a very large battery, and just like they said, it's supposed to hold eight hours of battery life with an eight days of standby time. Now, it's been about three days since I've charged it, and I just looked, it's 46% charge remaining, and that's with using it a little bit here and there. I used it to, I've shot this video once before already, so it has had a little bit of use just in the last hour or so. But moving things right along, let's go ahead and open it up and we'll just walk through each individual component. The first thing on the inside to take a look at is the most noticeable item, of course, the screen. We have a 12.1 inch, 1280 by 800 screen. The wonderful thing about this 12.1 inch screen, it's just bigger than a netbook, but just a bit smaller than a laptop. Traditionally, when I do think of a netbook, I think of something 11 inches or smaller. So 12 inches is just smaller than what I would consider a laptop, which would be about 13 to 17 inches. However, the resolution on it, 1280 by 800, is more fitting of a laptop than of a netbook because a netbook would traditionally have a 1024 by 768 display. In addition to that, it's not a glossy screen, just like the outside. Glossy holds fingerprints, glossy reflects light really, really well. So having the matte screen, I do prefer it. If you prefer something glossy, that's, that's entirely up to you. But like I said, it's a little easier for me to see on a matte screen. Now while we're talking about the screen, it's only fair to talk about the VGA port here on the side. I mentioned this during the unboxing video. If you hook that up to a monitor, I did this at work the other day, the monitor I used was not a widescreen monitor, and instead of using the monitor's native resolution of 1280 by 1024 it took the closest I think that it could get, which would be 1024 by 768 and it mirrored it on this screen and on the monitor that I was using. Now it could be that I've missed something, but I had to do a full system reboot to make that happen. I believe after looking at some keyboard combinations that there is a way to make it work without having to do that. And since we're talking about keyboard combinations and things like that, let's go ahead and show you a list of them. If I hit Control Alt and the forward slash, a virtual keyboard shows up. And when you hit Control, it shows you all of the things that happen when you hit a specific key while holding Control. Now you see here we've got mirroring. If I were to hit that button while connected to a VGA, I assume that it would go ahead and turn it on. I don't have one nearby that I could do at the moment, so we just won't even worry about that. The majority of the rest of these keyboard shortcuts, at least for the control, have to do with just Chrome. There's some really common ones like going to tabs 1 through 8. You've got the zoom in, zoom out, zoom normal, opening things, print things, view the source, tabs, all of these sorts of things you would traditionally see in the Chrome browser. When you hit the Alt key, you've got the ability to go to different windows. If you've got multiple windows open, multiple copies of Chrome running. In addition, one of the keys that I was really missing, a bunch of keys I was missing on this keyboard, page up, page down, home, end, things like that. You've got page up, page down if you hold Alt and hit up or down. Now if you hit Control Alt, we get a third set of options. You see Control Alt and this little button, the, the forward slash is the keyboard menu that we're looking at, the keyboard viewer. And you've got Control Alt up and down for home and end. So basically, the page up, page down, home, end, those are all accessible. They're just not terribly easy to get to if you don't know the key combinations. Now, since we were talking about keyboard shortcuts, that's probably the next thing good to talk about, the keyboard and the touchpad. Now, the keyboard, it's just the right size, in my opinion. You may have big fingers, you may have smaller fingers, you may not like this exact size, but it is as close to the size of a full keyboard as I've seen. 
Now the one problem I've found with this, the key layout is not exactly the same as what you'd expect from a keyboard. For example, you're missing the caps lock key. This is a search key, so if I go ahead and hit that, it's going to take me to a new tab and take me to the search box. In addition, you don't have F keys across the top. You sort of do, but you sort of don't. Instead of the traditional F keys, you've got a forward and back button, you've got a refresh button, you've got a window full screen button, you've got the button to switch to a different window, brightness keys, volume keys, and the power button. Now while it is extremely handy to have that, for a person who is not familiar with the keyboard, they may not know exactly what those do. And while typing on it, at first it's a little bit daunting because the keys don't really go all that far down, so it's a little bit difficult to get used to. But after typing on it for just a short amount of time, it is very easy to get accustomed to it. And I have to say, the same sort of thing applies for the touchpad. Like I mentioned in the unboxing, it's just a touchpad, there are no buttons to it, but the whole thing is one button. So if I go ahead and click, the whole thing clicks. In addition, there's an option to use tap to click, so you could just tap on it. I've gone ahead and disabled that because I really don't like it. They've also added a sort of a gesture interface. So if you're using one button, that is the traditional left click. If you use two fingers and click, that is a right click. You see a right mouse menu opened up. If you use two fingers and move down or across, that does a vertical or a horizontal scroll. And while I admit that's extremely cool, and it is very nice to have such a large touchpad, there is a bit of a learning curve to it. Now the last couple of things about the hardware, we've got a microphone and webcam. I did a very brief test with that on Ustream, on Justin TV, and I did a recording on my second channel, Twill Talks. If you'd like to see the recording I did here on YouTube, I will have a link to that in the source code below and an annotation. I have to say, it didn't turn out terribly well. I don't know if it was a fault on the part of YouTube's live uploader, or if it was a fault with the webcam. The audio, however, sounded pretty decent. Now that does bring us to these last couple of items on the side here. We have, of course, the power port where you can plug it in to charge it. Like I said before, it does have decent battery life, so this won't be happening terribly often. You've got the USB port that you'd think you could use a storage device on, but that doesn't appear to work correctly yet. You've got the headphone jack, which works just like you'd expect it would. You plug a pair of headphones in, it works. You've got the SD card reader, which I guess if you're putting pictures on it would work. I haven't had any opportunity to take pictures and try to upload them. But from what I've read, if you put an SD card in there and you go to Picasa or to Flickr or any of those online services, it will pop up an uploader screen that you can use to pull, pull items off of that card. But as far as the hardware is concerned, that's basically all there is to it. Now we get to take a look at Chrome itself. Now I've done a very quick look at Chrome a little while back. I'll have a link to that video in the source code if you want to take a look at that, just a general look at Chrome operating system. But basically, it's a web browser. It's a web browser with a little bit more on top of it. Basically the things that you would need to control an operating system. As far as your day-to-day -day life type stuff, you're going to have these new tabs across the top. You can have as many tabs as you want. I noticed once you go above about three or four tabs, it can get a little bit sluggish. But when I was doing the news video last week, I think I had 20 to 25 tabs running, and it was keeping up admirably. Over here on the right-hand side, you've got your clock, you've got your network settings, you've got your battery life. You see we're at 44% battery life now, and that's after doing this video twice and doing some other stuff this afternoon, just using it a little here and there and letting it sit for three days. Down below that, you've got all of your different extension buttons. I've got Google Reader and uh, Adblock and a couple other things. I've got Adblock disabled, by the way. Uh, Gmail, Google Voice. This one, by the way, if you are using Chrome operating system, this will be terribly, terribly useful. Chrome Access, it's an extension, very useful. If you click on it, it shows you all of the available settings that you can change. Now here at the top, you've got the top five that are traditional Chrome extension things. Extensions, history, downloads, bookmarks, and settings. Then you've got the items that you can change that are operating system related, like the network info, memory info, DNS, plugin, cache info, syncing info, if you wanted to sync across different browsers, different systems. Histograms and flags. Histograms I have not looked at, so let's take a look real quick. That shows you the autocomplete. It just shows you a lot of information about what you've been doing. After looking at it a little bit, I'm not sure exactly where that's going to be going. I'm guessing it's just for debugging type information. A lot of it's like the disk cache I.O. time, uh, just the amount of time that it takes to cert do certain things, different rates that have been recorded on your system. Probably just for debugging info. I would hope that it's not being reported back, but it did not show anything specific about me. Now the last item in this little operating system section is flags, and that's something that I, I was actually kind of happy to see. These are experimental Google Labs type things. 
For example, we've got the media player and the advanced file system. You can enable a media player to have something local. Like if you were on a website and it had an MP3 embedded in it, you could click on that MP3 to play it in the built-in media player. However it is experimental, it could break. In addition, we've got that advanced file system I mentioned. You can turn it on to be able to browse USB and SD cards. I plugged in a USB card, an SD card, all of those things. It pulled up this content browser, which has not gone away since. Uh, if you click on it, it will go away temporarily. Control O will bring that up again, and you can look through all of the files built into the system. The files including, you know, screenshots and network diagnostics, and that's about it. Now the one problem I had with that file browser didn't work. Uh, when I plugged in a USB drive, it would not let me browse it. It would let me see the title of the drive, but I couldn't actually go into it. Did some reading online, not really working for much of anybody as far as I can tell. And there are some other items in here you can use that are experimental. Moving the tabs over to the side, enable remote client support. I would assume that that has to do with remote applications. There was an item we talked about a while back called Chromoting, where you're supposed to run remote applications using this. I don't believe it's ready yet though. You've got the ability to disable outdated plugins. You can audit for cross-site scripting, background your web applications. So if you have them set to auto run, they will auto run. And you can do click to play to allow blocked plugins to run. And just to mention it, if you disable or enable one of these things, it wants to restart Chrome. I'm not gonna do that at the moment though. As far as the rest of things, you've got your bookmarks bar. I had a bunch of bookmarks I synced over from another Chrome installation. And then you've got your apps that you've installed. A couple come pre-installed, but you can go into the web app store and install new ones. You'll notice this doesn't look like traditional Chrome. I've installed a different theme. One theme at a time, as I found out after installing 20 different themes. And then at the bottom, you've got your most visited and your recently closed tabs that you can take a look at if you want to. Now, the last thing to mention when talking about all this is the networking. Now, it does come with built-in wireless 802.11bgn, and that does seem to work pretty admirably. I used it here, I used it at work, and they both were able to connect very easily. I also used it on a friend's network who has a hidden SSID and WPA2, and it connected very quickly, very easily, did not lose connection one time. I'm using it on Verizon Wireless now. Uh, Verizon, for one thing, did not work for me out of the box. I've got a couple of friends who have these CR48s as well. Didn't work for any of them. I know it worked for a lot of people on the internet, for a lot of reviewers. For me, would not connect at all. Just timed out. So, with the wonderful help of my Google Chrome Ninja, Bert, we got in touch with Verizon, we managed to get everything activated, and now I'm able to use Verizon. This does come with 100 megabytes of data built in for free every month for two years. And I've used about 20 megs now, so I've got 80 megabytes available. I've done the testing a little bit. Speed test shows me that I have about uh, one megabit down and about 0.3 megabits up, which is not great for 3G. Where I'm sitting at the moment, I'm in a basement, so I don't have much, much good connection at all. Uh, but if I go ahead and run the test, we'll just see what happens. All right, so being in my basement, I've got almost 0.6 megabits a second down and almost 0.3 megabits up. Not great, but like I said, I'm in a basement. I've got one bar of signal. I tried it upstairs earlier on my, my dining room table, and I had about one to one and a quarter megabits download speed. I think that's about on average as far as 3G is concerned. I actually tested my cell phone on AT&T earlier, and it was less than one megabit per second download. So, I don't know, it's on par. Not really impressive. And one last thing I did forget to mention, the one thing that I left out of my initial Chrome OS review before, there is sort of a terminal built in. If you hit Control alt t you're taken to a black screen that eventually turns into Crosh, C-R-O-S-H. As far as I understand it, that means Chrome Shell. There's a very limited list of commands that you can use with it. The one key command that I was missing and that is available here is SSH. So I can, from here, SSH into my home server. I can get into my IRC client and use this as an IRC client. So for those of you who are interested in the terminal, this is a way to do it. But if you really are into it, you'll probably jailbreak the device, so uh, let's not even go into that. But that basically concludes the review of the CR48. Now that this review is done, I'll probably be flipping the developer mode switch and trying out Ubuntu or Arch Linux on it to see what I can do with it, to see the capabilities of the hardware, and just make sure everything is working appropriately. So tell me in the comment section below, what do you think of the CR48? If you've gotten your hands on one, has it worked for you as well as this has worked for me? What do you think of Chrome operating system or the idea of cloud computing? Because I know a lot of you are not a fan of putting your data out there in the cloud. And I do have to agree a little bit on that. As far as putting sensitive data out there, I'm not a fan. But for just everyday stuff, for writing up small documents, it's really not that bad for that. 
But that's all for today. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you next time.